So, my name is Kaylin Glover. First off, I am not going to try to convince anybody that you should not be Christian or that you should be Christian or vice versa. This is just dealing with some of the common issues we have here. Religious beliefs are very personal and it's important that you recognize that you are entitled to yours and to keep them that way. We started giving this lecture because a lot of our incoming students were struggling with reconciling the concepts of evolution that they were learning in their science classes with their religious beliefs. Um, most in this area are um, evangelical or fundamentalist Christian of some kind and it's not a very common um, idea that evolution can, you can both accept evolution as well as be a Christian, which is what most people are in this area. And so we created this lecture to help our students who are in these classes and are struggling with these concepts. And I'm perhaps uniquely suited for this because that was me. Whenever my high school science teacher first hinted that he might accept some principle behind evolution, the first thought that popped into my head was, oh, he's going to burn in hell. And it was really sad because I loved this guy. He was made a huge impact in my life. And I was certain that he was doomed to hell because he accepted evolution. And it wasn't until I spent several years studying science that I realized that I had a lot of misconceptions, that I had prejudged him prematurely um, before I actually knew what evolution meant and what evolution is and all the evidence we have for it. And it really comes down to this. This is a very simplified version of the scientific method. And it's important because that's how we learn science. All the information we have about science comes through some study using the scientific method. And it's important because science can't answer all questions. If, it's, if you can't study it using the scientific method, then it's not science. So there are questions about God and religion and belief and about beauty and art that are outside of the realm of science. And that doesn't mean that science is better than these other concepts. It's just something completely different. And that's OK. Really, you can think of it as having two different types of reality, a spiritual reality and a physical reality. So if you believe in God, then you believe that God is responsible for both scripture and nature, the word of God and the physical creation of God. Unfortunately, both of those are subject to human interpretation we then filter what God created and gave us, and we, with our human limitations, then try to make sense of it. And that's where we get theology and science. Now, theology, the purpose of that is to study our spiritual reality, whereas science, the purpose is to understand our physical reality. Because they both ultimately come from the same source, they should not conflict. The only conflict happens in us as we, with our very limited understanding, try to come up with our, under, and, uh, with our way of seeing things, and that's where the conflict happens. There is no real conflict, not in God's eyes. It's just us. So, what is evolution? Because that's usually where most people get lost. Evolution is defined as the cumulative change in populations over time. Please keep in mind that this is not the same thing as the origin of life. We're not talking about the first cell here. We're not talking about the spark of life. That's a concept completely different known as abiogenesis. Evolution is just talking about change in what life is already there, okay? Evolution is a very old concept, long before Charles Darwin. It was actually first proposed back in 600 BCE, which was 300 years before the Old Testament, the first four books of the Old Testament were compiled. That's a very long time. And this, it was well accepted in the scientific community for hundreds of years before Charles Darwin ever came around. So why was he important? What made him so special? Well, he wrote a book. He did a lot of traveling. He got a lot of observations. He compiled his observations and his conclusions in this book on the origin of species by means of natural selection. And that's what made Darwin famous, natural selection. See, everyone knew that evolution was happening. That wasn't a new concept. But what nobody understood was how it happened, the driving force behind it. And that's the beauty of, of natural selection. It's the mechanism, the primary driving force behind evolution. And what it essentially means is that the nature selects the next generation by allowing the most fit to reproduce in greater numbers. So those that had unfavorable traits would have lower reproductive success, whereas those with favorable traits those traits would appear more frequently in future generations. So 
there are four conditions required for evolution. The first is that a trait is heritable. If you can't pass it down, then it's not going to make any impact in the future. The second is that there is variation in that trait. If all the traits are exactly the same, it doesn't matter which trait succeeds over another because they're all the same. The third is that competition exists. If, uh, if everybody has access to the exact same resources and one's not going to survive over another, then there's no, got, not going to be any difference in terms of who's going to have, be more successful. The last is a differential reproductive success as a function of that trait. So in this illustration we have here, we have Joe and we have Jim. So we're going to create a metaphorical situation where Joe is a nice guy and Jim is a jerk. And we're going to say that being a nice guy and being a jerk are genetic because that's an easy metaphor regardless of whether or not that's an accurate representation of reality. So in this case, because Joe's a nice guy, he gets a girl. And so he gets a girl and his children end up being nice people and they end up having children. And so 45 years down the line, they've got a bunch of people who have this nice guyness gene, right? So in Jim's case, he was a jerk. He got no children. He got no wife. He did not have kids. So 45 years later, there's only one Jim to, what, nine Joes? So evolution happened. There's a change in the allele frequencies. We've got a change happening. That's natural selection. A favorable trait appears more often. An unfavorable trait appears less often. And that's essentially it. Really, this is evolution. Heritable variations in a population make some individuals more competitive than others. Thus, these individuals are more likely to reproduce and pass along these genes. Over time, different populations may become so different that they are no longer able to reproduce and interbreed and have a viable offspring. And they become so different that they are no longer the same species, even though they came from the same ancestor. This is evolution by means of natural selection. And that's all it means. So we get a lot of complaints about evolution, a lot of complaints. And this is probably number one. Evolution is just a theory, right? It's just some guy's idea, right? How many of y'all have heard that? I hear it all the time. The problem with this is that it doesn't take into account what scientists mean when they say the word theory. Most people think that scientists take hypotheses that become theories, that then become laws, and that then become facts. And then it's this hierarchy of certainness. That's not how scientists use the word. Um, it's very different than how the layperson uses that word. What we do is we take facts that help us develop hypotheses that then help us discover laws and from which we develop theories. Now let me explain this a little bit further. So we have a fact. A fact is defined as a repeatedly confirmed observation. If you were to take an apple and drop it, it hits the ground, right? We do this a lot. This is sort of the basis of, of everything, reason why we're not currently flying off the face of the earth, is because you drop something and it falls, okay? You can do this multiple times and that pin or that apple will still fall. So we take that, these repeatedly confirmed observations and we build a hypothesis. We go, what will happen if I drop it from a tree? What will happen if I throw it up first? What happens if I drop it over a body of water? Is it going to hit the ground or does it float? What happens? We create predictions based on the fact of an apple falling. So what happens when you drop an apple in space? Does it fall? No. And that's important because facts change based on the circumstances. A fact is only true in that place at that time in those circumstances. When the apples may start flying up tomorrow. We don't consider it likely, but it's entirely possible. Facts are not predictive. They're only describing what has happened. So in reality, hypotheses are more significant when it comes to science because we base them on our collective facts. We use facts to help us make predictions. Again, facts are only based in the past. Hypotheses can help us discern stuff that's going to happen in the future. So we take our tested high facts and we take our hypotheses and we are able to develop or really discover laws. A law is defined as a descriptive generalization that describes the behavior of something under a certain set of circumstances. Two key words here. It's descriptive and it's about behavior. Okay? Laws, that, that's all they do. They're usually represented mathematically, 
In this case, we're talking about the law of gravity. But they don't tell us anything else other than what is going to happen and allows us to make predictions and to gauge and, and make plans about what we're going to be doing. So from this, we still don't know why. We know what's going on, but we don't know why it's going on. And that's what a theory is. A theory is defined as an explanation based on all the available evidence from facts and laws and tested hypotheses. And that's the key thing. It is an explanation. Theories explain. So when people talk about evolution being just a theory, they're dismissing the fact that the periodic table of elements is a theory. The, there's the theory of electricity. There's the germ theory of disease. There's the cell theory. These are all theories that we don't go, oh, it's just a theory. No, because a theory explains everything. So when we talk about evolution being a theory, we're not saying it's just some guy's idea. We're talking about it explains everything in science. Another very common complaint, I get microevolution, but there's absolutely no evidence for macroevolution. The problem with this is misunderstanding the terms. Microevolution is defined as changes within a population. If you look at each one of those individual arrows, that's an example of microevolution. That's just a that little bitty change. Macroevolution is microevolution over time, from that first arrow to that last arrow. It's obviously changed, even though the microevolution was just a little bitty in between. So really, you can't logically believe in one without the other, because that's kind of like believing in inches but not feet. It's just a matter of perspective. As it turns out, though, we do have a lot of evidence for macroevolution. The fossil record is probably our biggest piece of evidence, um, and we will talk more in depth about this later. We also have the radiometric dating, which is probably one of the most sure ways we know of what's happened in the past and giving it time frames. It's physics, not so much biology in that case. <coughs> we also have comparative anatomy and physiology. Uh, this is our way of looking at structures from uh, ancestors and how they've changed through time. There's also vestigial structures, like the fact that baleen whales have a pelvis, even though they're not connected to any other bone structure and serve no unified purpose, they still have a pelvis because their ancestors had legs. We also have genetics. Molecular phylogenetics is the, one of the fastest growing areas of science today. We use molecular phylogenetics to trace the evolution of viruses and bacteria that infect us regularly. We also use it <coughs> to trace primate phylogenies from hundreds of thousands of years ago and more. It's one of the most reliable methods of learning about what has happened and historical events. Another very common complaint is, we weren't there, so there's nowhere you can test evolution. Well, the problem with this is we are humans who can think, and we can draw conclusions from the clues that we see around us. And so you may walk into your house, and you may see this, and you may go, well, I wasn't here, so I have no idea what happened. I think you're smarter than that. And CSI is entirely based on the concept of being able to figure out what happened based on the clues that are left behind. So what we do when it comes to evolution is we make predictions. We say, if evolution happened, what would we expect to find? And there are two main predictions that we get from that. The first is that more closely related species would be more similar. And the second is that over time, organisms should become more complex. So if we're looking at these two, let's look at the first one. Are relatives more similar? This is absolutely confirmed. In fact, we use genetic similarity as a basis of determine, determining relatedness. We do paternity tests for this very reason. As it turns out, all humans are over 99% identical. Our basic physiology is the same. This is why medicine as a field works. The same drugs that work in you work in me because our cardiovascular systems are the same and the hormones are the same and our nervous systems work the same. Our blood chemistry is the same. The veins run in the exact same places in all of our bodies, even though they're a little bitty tiny. Like, that's amazing. All of that has to be coordinated and we're all 99% identical. The differences between us are height, bone structure maybe, eye color, hair color, little bitty tiny things that don't really matter. We're also 
98% identical to chimpanzees. A lot of the same medicines that work on us work in them. They have complex social structures. They can communicate. It's, we have a lot of similarities between us and chimps. We're also 50% identical to bananas. On the cellular level, a lot of the same uh, metabolic processes that go on in bananas happen in us. And that's really what's important is the cellular level. You know, genetics happens the same way, same nucleotide sequences. Okay, so the second, the second prediction, do organisms increase in complexity over time? This is also absolutely confirmed. Natural selection selects for organisms that thrive in their environment. And to thrive in an environment, you are more specialized than somebody who is more generalized. And that specialization makes you more complex. And this is absolutely confirmed, and we have a lot of evidence for this, most particularly in the fossil record. Now, a lot of people like to knock the fossil record, but that's usually because they don't understand the fossil record and how we date things. So we're going to talk about that and explain why we, how we date the fossils and why it's so reliable. So there's two dating methods we use. The first is relative dating. And it allows us to figure out the order of events based on the fossil's location in the strata. The farther down they are, the older they are, and the closer to the top, the younger they are. So take relative dating, and then we add to it absolute dating. Now, absolute dating is a little tricky because it can only be used in igneous rock. When igneous rock forms, it traps radioactive isotopes. And those isotopes will decay at a very specific rate, depending on the particular isotope. So sometimes it's a fast decay, sometimes it's slow, but we know the rates. So it'll decay from a parent to a daughter uh, isotope. And at the, whenever we go to compare it, we compare that ratio of parent to daughter. And that gives us how long it's been since that rock solidified. And it's very handy. It's important to recognize that different isotopes are used for different ages. A lot of people talk about carbon-14 dating. Carbon-14 dating is only valid for 50,000 years. Anything older than that, which is pretty much most of the fossils that we deal with in science, it's not valid. So we use other types of dating, like rubidium strontium <coughs> and potassium argon. Those are much more valid dating when it comes to the type of long-term evolutionary change that most of us, that a lot of scientists are dealing with. So when we are we working with absolute dating, it's important to make sure that we are um, controlling for any outside variables. So to make sure that it's accurate, we will take this one sample and we will test multiple isotopes. And we will take, do the same thing and take multiple samples from the same site. And then we, take, we look at multiple samples from other sites that are all around that, are, that were laid down at the same time. So we've got lots and lots and lots of things to test for in order to control for any original daughter isotopes that were present in the sample and for any inaccuracies in sampling and data collection. So what we do in order to date the fossils, we use a combination of both. So we will take our radiometric dating and we will date what we can. In this case, there's a lava flow at about 450 million years ago, and there's granite at 480 million years. And between that, we have fossils. And it's a very particular set of fossils, and it's a very distinct pattern. And so we know that those fossils were laid down between 480 and 450 million years ago. So then we're looking at this other site that doesn't have any local igneous rock but it has that exact same pattern of fossils, that very unique distinctive layer. And because we know that this other distinctive layer was laid down between this time period, we know that that time period, that those fossils were laid down during that same time period as well. And that lets us know that anything older than those fossils is older than 480, and anything younger is younger than 450. So that's how we use a combination of relative dating and absolute dating. So as scientists, the big thing that scientists do is we look for patterns, and that's the important thing. Science is all about pattern recognition. So we look at these fossils and we go, what patterns do we see in the fossil record? Okay, so here's some of them. One, very consistent radiometric dating. If they're using the right isotopes or the right samples, then they, you don't get anything weird. You'll have four or five different isotopes that are all pointing to the exact same time frame, and it's really cool when you actually do that. Another is that we will find some fossils that are similar to modern fossils, but then we'll also see some fossils that we've never seen before, that are completely new. 
we will see the slight variation of the exact same species change gradually over time. From one to the next, it may not look very different, but by the beginning to the end, they look dramatically different. We also find completely unique species in isolated areas. Studying the speciation of islands and the biogeography there is one of the most fascinating areas of biological research because islands that have been separate from other areas for a long period of time develop really unique species like Australia. Anybody ever wonder why Australia has so many weird animals? That's why, all right? So we use this to help us figure out the fossils in those areas tell us about the history of those areas and when they um, when, when those species speciated. That's what we call when a, when a new species emerges. Probably most significantly, we have never found a fossil out of place. We've never found a modern fossil with an old fossil. And that would completely revolutionize all of biology. Just one fossil, just one, would completely throw the theory of evolution out the window. We have yet to find any, and there are millions of fossils that we have. The fossil record is amazingly consistent. It's true, we don't have a specimen of every species that has ever existed, but you don't have a record of all your ancestors either. That doesn't mean they didn't exist and that doesn't mean that you aren't descended from them. The truth is, is that evolution is fundamentally and overwhelmingly substantiated by the failure to falsify this prediction of increasing complexity through time. Quote Niles Eldridge. Another very common complaint. There are no transitional fossils. If evolution were true, we'd have crocodiles. Now, you may laugh because we, you know, this is like a pretty silly picture, right? The idea of a crocodile. But you would be surprised at how many times people have actually used this argument to explain or to declare evolution can't be true. We don't have these. The problem with this is that that's not evolution. Evolution would never predict anything remotely like a crocodile. That's because evolution, that splitting off, does not occur as a crocodile becomes a duck. Okay? It splits off long, 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 long time ago when crocodiles and ducks shared a common ancestor. And that's a really important concept. See, this is really how that splitting off occurs. At those nodes where those lines connect, that's the common ancestor. And everything else are transitional fossils. And we actually really do have a lot of transitional fossils. This is just one example. This guy, these, tra re these real transitional fossils occur when two lineages stop interbreeding. When they can no longer produce viable offspring, they're no longer considered the same species. This is one example. This guy is 375 million years old. He had gills and scales like a, an aquatic species, but he also had ribs, a flexible neck, and a crocodile-shaped head that you only find in land species. The real point about transitional fossils is this. Can you point to the exact, exact place where it stops becoming blue and becomes red? And you can't. And that's how evolution works. There is not one single species that gives birth to another species. There's not one mother with a child that looks completely crazy. That doesn't happen. Evolution would never predict anything like that. Instead, it's gradual change over thousands and thousands of years. In reality, all <coughs> species are transitional. There is no scientific, there is no such thing as a missing term or as a missing link scientifically. That's no such thing. It doesn't exist. That's a, that's a non-scientific term because we're all just points on a continuum. Another very common complaint, if humans evolved from apes, why are there still apes? Well, guess what? Humans didn't evolve from apes. Evolution does not say humans evolved from apes. Did you evolve from your cousin? No, you share a common ancestor, a grandparent, really two grandparents, okay? Similarly, most Americans are descended from Europeans, but they're still Europeans today. Protestantism came from Catholicism, doesn't mean there aren't Catholics today, okay? These are divergent events, and that's how this works as well. This is part of the problem. This is a very famous piece of art called the March of Progress. And a lot of people look at this and go, that's what evolutionists believe, that, hum that a monkey turned into a human. And it's so completely wrong. So a lot of scientists get really frustrated when they see these images because it's perpetuating this misconception about what evolution is and what it means, and it's just not true. 
The real point is that there is not a single shred of scientific evidence to dismiss evolution. Not any. Any amount of evidence, this is the tiniest little bit, would result in that particular scientist becoming the most famous scientist in the world. They would win prize after prize and high schools and colleges would be named after them. Everyone would know their name. There are a lot of people who are looking for that evidence right now and nobody has found any. They've all been refuted. So why are so many people looking for this evidence? Because they believe that they cannot accept their religious beliefs and science at the same time. A lot of people believe that they are contradictory, that you cannot have both. Well, the good news is that you can. They're not contradictory concepts. They actually exist on a continuum. And this comes from the National Center for Science Education. It's called the Creation Evolution Continuum. And most people find themselves somewhere along the spectrum. So we're going to talk about the first group first, logically. These are the young earth creationists, or the special creationists. They believe that everything today was created by God with very little variation. Okay. So this first group are the flat earthers. Okay. And yes, they still exist. There's a website, the flatearthsociety.org. You can Google it. Um, they believe that the earth is flat, that the sun, moon, planets, and stars are just a few hundred miles above the earth. And they take as evidence for this biblical references to ends of the earth and quadrants of the earth. Logically, they also reject all modern science because you can't really accept that and any science. This is actually, they, they actually publish and produce things like this as, as instructional and educational models, maps and globes and things. So the second group are the geocentricists. They believe that the sun revolves around the earth and that the Earth is stationary. This is surrounded by a dome called the firmament. For evidence for this, they use biblical references to the sun rising and setting, God walking on the firmament, a stationary Earth, the Earth shall not be moved, right? And they also reject all modern science. The last group are the young Earth creationists. They believe that the Earth is between 6,000 and 10,000 years ago and that God created kinds of animals that have undergone very slight changes since then. Catastrophes are responsible for the geological formations and the fossil record that we have today. Unfortunately, that doesn't quite fit the data. Um, and they also reject all modern science. So a little bit about the Great Flood and the fossil record. This is something I believed for a long time until I realized that it doesn't quite work. But it makes sense, right, that the Great Flood is responsible for all this fossils found in sedimentary rock that's laid down by water, right? Totally makes sense. Okay, so like all the, all the organisms that couldn't run away, that were more primitive, would have died first, and organisms that could swim and tread water or could run away and get to higher ground would end up dying later, right? Makes perfect sense. So we make a prediction because science is all about making predictions. The prediction is all plants are found at the lower levels, right? Because no plants can run. They can't float, they can't, they can't swim they're going to die first. And so what do we find? That it's completely unsupported. Flowering plants, which are the, considered the most advanced plants that we have, are only found in the very most recent strata. Only found. We've never found a flower anywhere underneath the rest of them. Flowers can't fly. They can't swim. They're, they would have died first. You also will never find a Triceratops or a Stegosaurus at the same strata. It's because they did not live at the same time. Even though physiologically they both would have survived about the same amount of time or would have run away or been able to float about the same amount of time, but they didn't. And so, but we still do not find them at the same place in the fossil record. So going back to our continuum, the next group here are the old earth creationists. They are also known as the theistic creationists. They believe they believe that the earth is ancient, that changes have occurred, and that God is personally responsible for them. This is what's accepted by most Christian faiths as official doctrine, by the way. So the first group here are the gap, cre gap creationists, or the gap theory. They believe that between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, there's a time gap where the first creation that <coughs> took 4.6 billion years to get here was destroyed and then recreated in six 24-hour days. They believe, they accept the existence of a very old earth, the existence of dinosaurs, very old geological formations, and the fossil record. 
The next group here, these are the day age creationists. And I thought this one for a long time too. Unfortunately, this doesn't fit the fossil record either. We don't see all the plants showing up at the same time and then all the animals showing up at another time. There's a whole lot of overlap there that would not make sense with that particular creation story. The next group are the progressive creationists. And this is the most common group. Okay? They believe that the Earth is um, very old, that it was created gradually with God creating kinds of animals at very specific times but they reject a common ancestor. So they accept the geological age of the Earth, the Big Bang, the fossil record, and microevolution. What they reject is macroevolution, which we've already talked about. It's not really logically possible to do that. So a little note about the Big Bang. A lot of people don't understand the Big Bang in its entirety. A lot of students tend to think that the Big Bang was an atheist's way of explaining away God. Right? Because that's, you know, whatever. That's just the atheist's version. Well, the truth that most students don't know is that the Big Bang was first proposed by a Catholic priest by the name of George Lemaitre. To him, the idea of all the matter and energy exploding out of a point smaller than the head of a pin sounded a whole lot like let there be light. To him, the Big Bang was proof of God. Later on, when Hubble confirmed the Big Bang, it was then rejected by creationists. So if we go back to our continuum here, some of you may have noticed this little phrase at the bottom here called intelligent design. And this is an important concept. A lot of students have heard about intelligent design. It's also known as creation science. Um, it has been ruled a belief system by the Supreme Court. Just FYI, it is, a, it is not considered science by the scientific community, it is considered a belief system. They believe that naturalism is a threat to religion and must be defeated. And that their gaps in the scientific knowledge are, prove the existence of God. So the things that science doesn't have an answer for, thus is explained by God. God did it and that's the end. Uh, they look for evidence for this, they look for concepts called irreducibly complex systems. And what this means, are they're looking for systems that they believe are too complex to have evolved. Some classic examples include the vertebrate eye, the quote, perfect human body, and the bacteria flagellum. Those are some classic examples. So far, all of these have been refuted by science. They've all been proposed and scientists have gone, hey, that's a great idea, I'm gonna study that. And we've actually discovered the mechanisms behind that and they've won some pretty fantastic scientific awards for that. So just saying, keep the ideas coming, people. Um, so a lot of theologians also have issues with the idea of intelligent design, believe it or not. For much of Judeo-Christianity, faith is a central component. Faith is necessary. We are required to have faith in God. So many argue that God would not have created a world in which you could prove his existence scientifically. Because if you could prove the existence of God, why would you need faith? It would negate the necessity for faith. The reality is, is that intelligent design isn't science. And because it's not science, it doesn't belong in a science classroom. And there is no scientific controversy concerning evolution. So when we teach kids that there is a scientific controversy, we're really being dishonest, and we're undermining the very principles that science is founded on. When we talk about teach both theories and let the kids decide, we're not teaching them magic and physics. We're not teaching them astrology and astronomy. We're only saying evolution and creationism, even though they're not even opposites. We're presenting this false idea that they can't have both by teaching them two different versions. And there's another reason why it's a problem. And it comes from this. This is the first part of the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. And there are two clauses to this. The, the second is the free exercise clause that states that the government cannot prevent you from exercising your religion. The first is the establishment clause the states that, that states that the government cannot support any religious doctrine in any way. So really what this means is freedom of religion means all religions. So if we were to teach a creation story in a publicly funded mandatory science class, 
which creation story do we choose? The Iroquois that believes that the earth is formed on the back of a tortoise? The Hindu version that believes that the earth was formed when Brahma took the lotus blossom that grew from Vishnu's belly and turned it into a, the earth? Or the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, and who believes that the earth was created when the Flying Spaghetti Monster had one too many beers? It's officially a religion. People have officially declared it as their belief. Now, the religion was created satirically because a father whose daughter was in her science class and they were teaching creation stories, were teaching the Christian creation story as science. <coughs> and he said, if you're going to teach this story, you have to teach mine too. It's not fair. Why are you teaching this one over another? So he satirically created this religion and it's hilarious. I highly recommend looking it up. They're called Pastafarians, in case you didn't know. If we were to teach creation stories, we would have to teach them in a comparative religions class by an objective party, and we would have to teach all creation stories. That's the only way we can do this ethically and morally. So back to our continuum. This last group here are the evolutionary creationists. They believe that God created the earth, created all life using evolutionary principles, using science. They accept all aspects of science. They just think God took a bit of an active role in how he did it. So if we go back to this continuum, there's one more section down here, and these are the official evolutionists. The, the, the position of, of this group is that the world has changed through scientific laws, and that's pretty much it. They work in a system called naturalism, and there are two types of naturalisms, and it's very important to recognize the difference between these. The first is materialistic naturalism. They believe that science can only study the natural world. Therefore, any religious beliefs you have are independent of science. This is the actual realm of science. Science is considered a materialistic, naturalistic philosophy or a concept. Okay? The second are philosophical naturalists. And these guys believe that there can be nothing other than the natural world. They reject an, a belief in anything supernatural. Now that is an actual belief and not science. Now they're entitled to that belief just like anybody else, but it is a belief and not science. So when you hear anti-religious statements coming from scientists and other people, that is their belief and not officially science. So if we're going back to this continuum, the first group here are called theistic evolutionists. They're very similar to the last group. They believe that God created everything using um, evolutionary principles and that science is God's tools to bring about his plan. They accept all science. The second group are the agnostic, uh, are the agnostic evolutionists. They claim that it's impossible to know whether or not there is a God, but that to discount the existence of God is intellectually dishonest. They don't think it's important necessarily that there is a God. They don't think the question is important to their lives, but they don't dismiss it entirely. The last group, or perhaps the most famous groups, are the atheistic evolutionists. They claim that there is no God. This is the group that tends to be a bit more um, anti-religious than the other groups um, by a large margin. Really, you can actually accept evolution based on theological grounds and not just scientific ones. And all it takes is a bit of deductive reasoning. If you believe in God, then you believe that God created the universe. And if you exist in this universe, then you can admit that the universe works through science. If you're currently not flying off the face of the earth or have ever used a cell phone or antibiotics, then you can pretty much accept this fact. Take these two premises and put them together. There's only one logical conclusion, and that is that God works through science. From this, we then realize that discovering science can actually teach us about him. As one theologian put it, God is the ultimate scientist. Really, they're just answering two different types of questions. Religion answers who. Evolution answers how. You can study both the artist and the artwork and gain information about either one. They should enhance each other not detract. You cannot study an artist's work 
and have it refute the artist. And you can't study the artist and have it refute his creation. They work together. A lot of students take issue with the idea of evolution because they believe that, because they have a hard time understanding how they could be special. If we're God's special creation, then why am I just another animal? Then why was I created through evolutionary processes? Well, I don't know about you, but if I could make something instantaneously, if it took no effort at all or no time, then I don't care a lot about that particular creation. But if I spent weeks working on a particular choreography, or months on a particular recipe, or years on a composition, then I care a whole lot about what I just created. So the idea that God spent 4.6 billion years to get me here makes me feel awfully special. Ken Miller tells a story of attending a seminar at a religious institution. And in it, uh, a woman who was giving her research, um, it had some evolutionary implications to it. And so somebody at the end was like, is it really appropriate that you be talking about evolution here? And she said, the creationist God is like a God who can walk up to a pool table and sink eight balls in a row, but by taking eight separate shots. My God is the God who can walk up to a pool table and sink eight balls in a row, but by taking one shot. So my question to you is which God is more worthy of praise and worship? Or the belief of Isaac Newton as summarized by Eugenie Scott, a God who worked through his created natural laws is a God more worthy of awe and worship than one who constantly intervened to maintain the universe. Thank you.